first thing we're going to do is check ATIS because we want to know what active runways are in use prior to going out doing the airfield inspections. Ten three, 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 five. Two point one. You have information, Bravo. El Paso International Airport. Now that I have all of the information I need, I can go back to our ground and our tower radio frequencies. And tower is the radio frequency that you want to talk to when you want to access the runways. The ground frequency is the radio frequency that you want to talk to when you're accessing the um, taxiways. So, I have both of my frequencies on. 121.9 is for ground. 118.3 is for tower. Now I have the information that I need. I know that the runways in use are runway 22 and runway 26 right. And I also made a mental note of the notums that I should be looking out for. And now we're going to proceed. localizer for runway 4. The localizer is used in the instrument approach landing system and it provides horizontal guidance for an aircraft on the runway. of our perimeter fence while doing inspections we have to ensure that our perimeter fence has no breach whatsoever and our perimeter fence primarily primary goal is to protect our airport and definitely to protect our nav aids the four boxes that you see right there are called pappies precision approach path indicator what the pappies do they provide a glide slope for the pilots and it lets them know whether or not they are above on or beneath the glide path also we have to ensure that our wind socks are intact our wind socks are also known as the wind director indicators we have to ensure that they are not faded that at night they are properly lighted and that there are no holes or any obstructions within the covering and the fabric. While doing perimeter inspections, I'm inspecting for signs, signs that indicate no trespass, now this is a restricted area, that unauthorized persons are not allowed beyond this fence. I'm also inspecting that the fence is six feet tall and has three strands of barbed wire tied at the top of the fence. One thing that all airports, many airports, have to deal with is wildlife. So you always want to check the base of the fence to ensure that it is properly aligned with the pavement so that no furry friends can get into our airport. Here we have the medium approach lighting system with runway alignment lights. And what this does, it provides a basic means of transition from instrument flight to visual flight.
This provides the basic means to transition from instrument flight to visual flight, and this is primarily used for landing. At this time, I'll be requesting access for the east taxiways. So being that I'm asking permission to maneuver around the taxiways, I'm going to be using the transmission control. I'll be going 1010. on ground frequency, which is 121.9. And prior to speaking over the comm, the ICOM system, I'm going to say what I want to say out loud to ensure that I'm not wasting any time or thinking about what I want to say before I actually say it. So here, we train anyone who has movement access to state first who they are, their location, and what do they want to do. So, oh, I'm sorry. The first thing first, you want to identify who you want to talk to. So I'm going to say El Paso Ground, Ops 9, wait on their response. I'm going to let them know where I'm located. I'm located at North Cargo. Let them know I'm at North Cargo and ask for permission to East Taxiways. You ready? Here we go. El Paso Ground, Ops 9. Ops 9, that's right. Ops 9 is at North Cargo requesting East Taxiways. Ops 9, proceed on East Taxiways. Proceed on East Taxiways, Ops 9. opposite way so we're getting him off of the signs and he is off the movement area okay. here's one of our mandatory instruction signs you can easily identify a mandatory instruction sign simply because they are red they have a red back background with white in with white inscriptions this stands for instrument landing system this is for aircraft that solely rely on instruments to land their aircraft in low visibility conditions. This sign also identifies as an ILS sign. However, it's not a mandatory instruction sign. It indicates the boundary exit for an ILS system. While completing our self-inspections, any area that is unserviceable to any air carrier aircraft has to be barricaded off as such. We also have to inspect to ensure that the flags are intact, that there is a functioning light, which we can't tell right now because of the sunshine, but at night that is something that we can verify. We also want to ensure that the barricades are stationary and cannot be moved. So just take a look at the rest of the barricades that we have here. And these barricades are closing off a portion of taxiway Kilo 2. you just witnessed was our taxiway edge light. Taxiway edge lights are our primary taxiway lights at El Paso International Airport. As you can see, the globe is blue and it is based on a frangible base. This frangible base is here in the event that an aircraft exits early or late from a taxiway or a runway, it can easily be knocked off the base without causing any damage to an aircraft. So just take a look. Now, some airports have taxiway centerline lights which are green in color here at epia we don't have to worry about the centerline lights because our taxiway edge line lights are our primary taxiway lights and typically they range they, they range in a distance of 25 feet from each other while doing our self-inspections is ensuring that nothing is stored, left, or in our taxiway safety area or our runway safety areas that are not required to be there per FAA standards. Now, many, actually most of our taxiways are 75 feet. Most of our taxiway safety areas at EPIA are 75 feet. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna see how far our taxiway safety area 
expands out from the taxiway center line. This right here is my nice measuring tool. It's called a wheel. What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna reset the wheel to zero. We're gonna walk over to the center line. I'm gonna show you all how it works. You literally just roll it and it's measuring in feet the distance that we're walking. Also, whenever you're out in the movement area, you need to be vigilant, never get comfortable, and aircraft can come our way at any second. So we're walking from the center line and we're measuring out our taxiway safety area. Now I just mentioned how far our taxiway safety area extends from the center line. Does anyone recall how many feet? Oh, you're right, 75. We're at 39, 40. Oh, bumpy road. Let's roll back a little bit. Here we are at 75 feet. This is the end of our taxiway safety area for Taxiway Juliet. Just past the pavement. Anytime you're in the movement area, you're constantly doing a surveillance inspection for any fog that you might find. You get 797 contact departure. Anything on the pavement that is usable to air carriers that's not Third supposed to be there is five. Five stands for foreign object debris. Now I'm just going to clear myself off the movement area so we may proceed. Paso Tower Ops 9 is off all movement area and no cargo. Ops 9, roger. Please. Right now we're just driving up to our ARF station at El Paso International Airport. So here's our ARF station. ARF stands for Aircraft Rescue Firefighters. At this airport we are index C. For the aviation industry, there are five different indexes for ARF. You have index A through E. All right. Good afternoon. My name is Lieutenant Duran. I'm a lieutenant here at the El Paso International Airport at the ARF station. ARF stands for the Airport Rescue Firefighter Station. It's a little bit different from the outside world. As you well know, we're right here in a very confined area. We're in the desert between all the runways and it's required by, of course, our FAA counterparts and, of course, through El Paso Fire Department uh, partners. Uh, to my right is Ed Ontiveros. He's one of our drivers here. And also Omar Parada, our driver here. And we also have Carlos Dorantes, firefighter paramedic. Uh, just to give you a quick uh, 
tour of the station, this is of course, we work 24 hour shifts, so when we're away from home, this is our home. We spend basically more time here than we do at home. So this is our family away from our family. So when we come to work at 11.45 till the next day, 11.45, we bring in our food and drinks and stuff like that because we're, again, we're in a confined area enclosed out here like the Fort Bliss or Bigsfield. And we do have a badge that we have to be um, badged in and badged out. So we, we're not free like other fire stations where we can go in the na neighborhood uh, supermarket, so to speak. So we all have to buy our groceries and everything. So no further ado, we got our living room. We do have recreation time, a little bit of TV, news, everything we can uh, keep up with, of course, but that's not till after 5 p.m. We do have our kitchen, as you can see, our table, one of our firefighters just got back from a call. He's eating his little late lunch at this time. And our, have a nice, spacious kitchen. And in our kitchen, of course, we do have like any other kitchen. We do have our freezer, we do have our large refrigerator, microwave, and other amenities. Every payday, we go ahead and pitch in. Uh, different stations vary, some from $5, some to $10. So we pay here $7 per person every payday so we can buy uh, the stuff we like, like a certain type of uh, dressings, uh, salt, peppers, uh, you name it, butters and stuff like that. You know, if you want a certain thing, we put it up for a vote and we get it. If we want a crock pot, then we'll put it and we can go ahead and go that route. We also have our maps. Here are indications what taxiways and runways are closed. There's always closed due to the nature of aircraft uh, coming in or they're doing a lot of uh, construction here at the airport. Always revamping and, you know, moving things forward. We do have maps of our stations, of course, and the desert areas and the runways. Yes. Along with safety and news, we also have customer service, which of course we pride ourselves, which is uh, the mission of our fire station, is to provide the emergency response prevention, preparedness, and education to its residents, businesses, and visitors of our city so they can live safely and prosper in a hazard resilient community. That's our mission statement. And that sticks as well as outside, as well as here at El Paso International Airport. Our vehicles are uh, situated. They are situated facing, of course, north and south, depending on the emergency that might uh, come in on a certain type of runway. That's why certain fire trucks or apparatus are positioned in this, this uh, way. Like uh, this uh, runway here of two six right and two six left, this, these vehicles would go out this way, and then the other ones would go and circle around if needed. At this time, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it on to uh, my fire suppression technician, Aaron Tiveros and Omar Parada. They are kind of the experts on these big vehicles, and they'll give you more of a talk on some of the specialties that each vehicle does. Ed? Yes, hello, my name is Aaron Tiveros for the Paso Fire Department. Uh, as you notice here, we have some uh, vehicles different array of vehicles. We have some small vehicles here. For example, this one, R4, is the actual uh, rescue unit vehicle that will go out to, uh, to take care of medical calls or mitigate certain emergencies, as well as the uh, rescue, of course, itself. And then you have the, the paramedic on board, such as the lieutenant, one of our lieutenants, uh, our paramedics here. We have a total of three paramedics here at this station. And uh, sometimes you'll see them switch and help each other out. Um, I'm going to show you real quick what each vehicle does. Uh, for example, this vehicle again is it takes care of a lot of emergencies. So you have a different uh, set of tools and items that, that you need, such as medical bags. So for example, if we do get a medical um, emergency, this vehicle could be, be the first one to, to get down and respond while waiting for the ambulance to cut down with their gurney and what have you. Um, different set of uh, equipment that we use, such as uh, we do out there in, on the city. The only difference is, is it's a little bit more fine-tuned for the airport itself, such as these big uh, vehicles over here. For example, the uh, vehicles in the city, they're all 500 gallon uh, tank capacity for water. You'll have these, for example, this is the T3000. This one has 3,000 gallons of water. And the other two trucks have 15, 1,500 gallons of water. Why do we have that much? Because at the airport, you can't just stop at any uh, hydrant and fill up. So that's why you, there's plenty of water in these vehicles. 
Now, the thing with that is that on a regular truck out there in the city is you have three, three personnel running that vehicle. You would have your officer running in charge, you would have your driver, and then you would have what they call the back-end man. So if you would go to, say, a, a fire, the back-end man and the officer would get down and try to go extinguish the fire while the driver, such as myself, We'll take care of the high, uh, uh, take care of the bumper and what have you to make sure that the firefighters going out there to extinguish the fire have plenty of water. The thing here, if you have one person doing all those three jobs, so so to each vehicle here, and this is the city of El Paso, we've gone to different conferences all over the nation, and you usually have a minimum of three guys per truck. Here in El Paso, there's only one person per truck, so we're managing three jobs that we do per, per vehicle, such as manning uh, the communications, looking at the territory where you're trying to respond, and then uh, managing your, your extinguishing agent. So we have to be very conscious of, of what you're gonna use your, your extinguishment for, and that abuse of it. Because once you abuse of it, there's no running to a hydrant and try to, you know, uh, fill well, up the your desert tanks. areas, so we have no hydrants. Um, <laughs> And now I'm gonna turn you over to Omar Parada. He's another driver, such as myself. Hello, my name is Omar Parada. I'm one of the drivers here on our Pisha. I guess the, the question was by Ops 9 was as far as fire requirements for the airport? Yes. I guess I'll go ahead and answer that question and then I think that'll be it. As far as the uh, Code of Federal Regulations requirements and uh, that are required here at the airport, we have three minutes from the moment we get the alarm to go to the furthest midway point of the uh, any uh, runway or taxiway. And uh, we do it in these trucks right over here. So, uh, you want to go to the trucks? Like in three minutes. And we have ARF-1, ARF-2, and ARF-3. ARF-1 was our latest truck, which is right over here. They're all odd class trucks. This one is actually an h rep truck, which has a High reach extendable turret. If we go up to the front, you can see it, which is kind of like threes. Same thing. Except the only difference between three and one is capacity of foam and water. This one pretty much has double the capacity of this one. And as far as your regulations, they're required. We're required to have uh, 3,000 gallons of water and two ten of foam provided by two vehicles. So to meet that requirement, we can either run with one and two or any combination of three and another truck. We can't run three alone because it's only one vehicle even though it has twice the capabilities. For example, this one has 1,500 gallons of water. This one has 3,000. This one has 210 of foam. This one has 420. This one has 460 pounds of auxiliary agent as well as this one has auxiliary agent, but this one's uh, Halotron. And that one's Brake Cam, and then we got the Halotron, uh, Brake Cam, which one's Brake Cam, right? Halotron, Halotron, and then Brake Cam. Okay. And, uh, would you mind, uh, Omar, excuse me, would you mind just touching base, because uh, Ops was looking at the, the piercing nozzle. Can you go and speak about the piercing nozzle and maybe the extension of it and the purpose of, say, the piercing nozzle on R3 versus uh, just the bumper uh, turret? Well, this one has a bumper turret. They all have bumper turrets. This one has, a, as you can see on three, you have a bumper turret. Okay. Difference between this bumper turret and this bumper turret has a right in front, meaning the turret can drop down to the floor level. We actually do a sweeping motion, or we can uh, attack it at a lower level and push the fire away. And push from the, the fire away from, from us from the plane. So we can, uh, like the lieutenant said, what's the difference between a high red? This one also has a turret on the top as well as you see on two. We, actually, we can actually shoot water from the nozzle, like this one has a nozzle and a nozzle, but here we have a piercing nozzle attached also. So it's able to penetrate the skin of the aircraft. So we'll go up to the top fuselage of the aircraft, penetrate, and we're able to disperse water inside the cabin. So it's more used for uh, cargo type applications, but if need be, and it has to be used in a civilian airplane application, it'll, it'll serve the same purpose. So that's the major difference between that type of nozzle up here and this type of nozzle right here. And as you well know, a lot of uh, here at the uh, 
uh, airport, we not only just take care of commercial aircraft, we also have a lot of uh, cargo aircraft like UPS, we have DHL, we have FedEx, and we have unexpected uh, people that come in, maybe like uh, President Trump, who just recently did a right here with his 747. So we always have to be ready for the type of aircraft that might be landing here and in case for any emergency, whether it's medical or any uh, operational thing, which would be maybe uh, something, a sensor might be wrong with a certain type of uh, mechanism on an airplane or something. And we do have the certain type of alert one, what they call alert two and alert threes. So we're always ready to stand by and assist here at the airport. I just want to thank you so much for all of the information that you gave us. It was a pleasure. You're very, very nice so meeting, meeting you again. And uh, you. anything that we can be assistance thank up here at the ARF station. You're welcome. And uh, good luck on your presentation. And, all. and from the ARF people here, A, B, and C shift. Thank bye -bye. you. Just say hi to the kids. Bye-bye. Hi. Bye. <laughs> thank you. El Paso Tower, Ops 9. Paso uh, Tower. Ops 9 is on South Fire Road, holding short runway 8 left, 26 right, requesting to proceed on runway 8 left for inspection. Ops 9, proceed on the runway 8 left. Proceed on runway 8 left, Ops 9. This is right here what we identify as runway 8 left, 26 right. This is a pavement area. This area is utilized for not air carrier aircraft, but general aviation aircraft. Let's hop in the vehicle for our runway inspection. I just saw uh, directly west of the face of the tower. This sign right here is called a distance remaining sign. This sign indicates how many feet you have left remaining on a runway. The specific runway we are on is 5,940 feet left. This four simply indicates that you have 4,000 feet left remaining on this runway. This sign, our DRM, is going to be a black background with a white inscription. At night, when we're doing our inspections, we want to make sure that the sign is clearly visible, that pilots can see how many feet they have left remaining on a runway. This light right here is our runway edge light. Any runway light on any runway will be white. Now, we do have some runways that have center line lights. If you come with me to the center of this runway, as you would see at EPIA, we have no center line lights. However, if we did have center line lights on our runway, they would be white, all white, until the last 3,000 feet then they would um, alternate from wet, red and white, and the last 1,000 feet, the lights would be all red. On our, on our air carrier runways, on the last 2,000 feet, our lights alternate amber and white. And you might get to see that later. El Paso Tower, Ops 9. Ops 9, El Paso Tower, you can proceed on uh, north taxiways, verify you're off of runway uh, 26 right. El Paso Tower Ops 9 is off runway 26 right, proceeding on north taxiways. If you look at the marking ahead of us that has two solid lines and two dash lines, this indicates our runway hold short marking. This marking lets you know that you must not proceed until you have received proper clearance from air traffic control tower and that frequency is what is it again 118.3 the solid lines indicate a non-movement area and the dash lines indicates a movement area a runway is a movement area a taxiway is a non-movement area so I don't know if you notice that as we approach the taxiway, the markings are a different color than the runway. Yes, you're right. At all airports, runway markings are white and taxiway markings are yellow. One thing I want to point out that we look for when we're doing inspections is the structure of the lights. If we see any light 
whatsoever that is off the frangible base. Like say for instance, if any one of those lights were broken, that is a 139 discrepancy. It has to get removed from the area and report it immediately so that the problem can be fixed. Let's go right down the North Taxiway. So here's one of the various signs that we must inspect while we're doing airfield inspections. This sign is simply a taxiway location sign. And how do I know that? Because it's a sign with on a back, black background and a yellow inscription. It's letting us know that we are on taxiway uniform. The mandatory instruction sign indicates that we are holding short runway 26 left and runway 8 right. If you look to the southeast, you can see our air traffic control tower. Inside that tower, you can see a rotated beacon, beacon, which is green and white. That beacon is a signal of light to pilots. Let's go.